He will pre be presenting on ways the Development Centre can support local businesses at no cost. He will also touch on Shop ND, um, where they have been helping people buy local without having to leave their home. So welcome, Tyler. Um, all right, good afternoon. Um, more intimate group today, probably uh, due, due to the weather uh, coming our way, but uh, that's all right. Uh, Katie, if there aren't any house rules, I just, I'll open it up for conversation. I think with a smaller group, at, at any point you want to interrupt me, you raise a hand, ask a question, uh, the more conversation we have, the, the better uh, this session will be, and uh, the more they'll get out of it. So, so please don't uh, hesitate to interrupt. But um, as Katie said, my name is Tyler Mars. I'm the, uh, the center director for our North Dakota Small Business Centers here in Bismarck. Um, the small business centers in North Dakota, some of you might be familiar with our services, will provide no cost business advising to entrepreneurs and small businesses across the state. Um, so today I want to take you through kind of how uh, we best support clients, resources available to all Pride of Dakota members through, uh, the, through our center and through our programs. And then we'll get into a bit about Shop ND, which is a newish platform that we've launched in the last three years or so. Um, so first, just a little bit about small business in North Dakota. So um, this is a map showing a uh, percentage of employees that work for small businesses by county. So the darker counties there have a higher percentage of, of employees that, that are employed by, uh, of all employees that are employed by small businesses. So um, in North Dakota, we have 75,000 small businesses. That's almost 99% of, of businesses in North Dakota. Um, a hundred, just over 200,000 small business employees, which is almost 57% of our employment base. And of course, you can see here by that map, our rural areas especially um, are, are more uh, dense with, with small business employees. Um, note that this data is put together by the SBA definition of small business. That's any business with under 499 employees. So there's lots of businesses that we probably consider fairly large that fit that, that SBA definition of small business. Um, so just some, uh, some contributions of how small business contributes to our economy. Um, of GDP, small business uh, contributes 46%. Uh, new private sector jobs, small business is over um, almost two thirds of all net business growth is attributed to small business. So what we're seeing there is that in larger, more corporate settings, we have lots of churn and we have automation, investment, technology taking more businesses where most of the net growth is actually happening in smaller firms. So that's, uh, um, that dynamic shifted a little bit in the past five years or so that we're not as concerned about job growth. We're, we're more concerned about finding people to fill jobs, um, but I, I found that interesting. And then the uh, percent of jobs that uh, small businesses have is 70% uh, compared to corporations at, at 30%. So sorry my graphs formatted a little goofy there with those percentages. but. All right, next up, we hear a lot about shop local and, of course, Pride of Dakota. Uh, that is a, a mantra of the Pride of Dakota program. Uh, here's some data uh, indicating why that's important. So uh, for every $100 spent at a nationwide chain store, only $15 stays in the local economy. Uh, compared to when you spend $100 at a locally owned and operated business, $45 or 45% of those dollars stay in the local economy. So um, we're seeing direct correlation, connection. Uh, between shopping in North Dakota and keeping our wealth in the state. Um, as having four kids in our house, we, we like a good Costco run, don't get me wrong, uh, but, it, but it is important that, that we're uh, um, prioritizing spending our local business and supporting our local businesses. And I know I'm probably preaching the choir in, in this room. So. Okay, so we see uh, small business is critical for North Dakota, and that's why the Small Business Development Centers exist. Um, so we work in partnership with the Small Business Administration at the federal level, uh, the Bank of North Dakota, uh, just on the river here in Bismarck, is our state matching partner, and then each of the nine markets we're in across the state provide a local match. And what they're supporting is all of these services that we provide to, uh, to entrepreneurs and small businesses. So one of the misconceptions about our program is that we only work with startups and only support people trying to start businesses, um, it's actually probably more a 60-40 split, that 40% of our clients have been in business for at least three years and are uh, expanding to a new location or having cash flow issues and need a turnaround or they're looking for advice with uh, a marketing strategy. So about 40% of our clients are, are existing businesses that have been in business for three years or more. So um, if, if you've been in business, we absolutely can support you and then follow a, a similar process to what we do with a startup. But, um, 
So a lot of uh, a lot of business development words on, on the screen here. Uh, I like to break down what we do into kind of five key areas, and then within those there are, there are two or three verticals that we, we get more hands on with. But um, the first is startup logistics or business logistics, and when we say logistics, we mean pretty much any place you're interfacing with the government. So incorporating legal entities, uh, sales and use tax permitting, um, if you're doing any um, patenting, trademarking, copywriting. I know uh, our friends from North, North Dakota Small Business Center, or excuse me, North Dakota Women's Business Center, I uh, talked a little bit more about that earlier today. Um, any licenses or permits that are relevant for your industry, well, we're a thinking partner in that space, making sure you have all the right boxes checked, you're navigating those processes, and you're in line with what the government expects of the private sector. Um, that's one, that probably where we spend um, less of our time, where we spend most of our time is in business development strategy. And that's where mo almost all of this goes into. And I, rather than get into each one of these, I break it up into four pieces. Um, first is just understanding your value proposition. So here's the product or service we're selling. Here's uh, why people want to buy it. That's one. The next is is a market strategy. Um, so in that is uh, what is our what does our target customer look like? Uh, what is the size of the market for this product or service? Who's our competition? How are we reaching customers? Speaking in and researching all of that. Um, to the third piece, operations planning, and that goes into uh, what skills and experience do we need, uh, what facilities, equipment, other team members potentially, um, uh, what uh, vendors do we need to execute on that value proposition, and then that all informs the fourth piece, which is the financial model. And that's definitely where we get most hands on and probably what we're best known for is developing financial projections and doing cash flow analysis for our clients. Um, so whether you are a startup, it's very important, but equally important when you're an existing business. And oftentimes we see with our clients that you, you work on a financial projection during the startup process, but then you're two years down the road and you haven't pulled it off the shelf or, or pulled it up on your computer in two years and you need to revisit it and make sure you're in line to see, all right, here's what we're at, here's what we projected, here's what we're actually seeing, how, how do we adjust and, and uh, pull the levers within that model to, uh, to make more informed decisions about our business. So. Um, Okay, so those are the four big pieces, and I'll, I'll get a little deeper into those now. Oh, first, here's a, here's a map of our services. Where's, where's everybody from in here? If we, can we start over here? Bismarck. Bismarck, okay. Underwood. Underwood, okay. Russo. Russo, okay. Uh, Big City. Big City, okay. We're serving north of Bismarck. Gotcha. Grand Forks. Grand Forks here, okay. Patton. I'm sorry? Patton. Patton, okay. Bismarck. Cat, I know where you're from, yeah. Hi, hi, Marsha. I know where you're from, too. I'll go back there. Valley City. Valley City, okay. Okay, so yeah, here's here's a map of our centers. Um, like I said, we're in nine communities across the state. Um, Dickinson, Bismarck, uh, Fargo, Grand Forks, Devils Lake, Minot, Williston. We have a satellite center in Crosby, and then Bowman has their own center down there as well. Um, so the first thing I mentioned was startup logistics, and our Secretary of State's office does a really good job supporting our private sector with that as well. So um, we went through, some of you may know, a transfer to completely paperless uh, with our Secretary of State Department, and especially with their Business Services Department, like three or four years ago, and that went remarkably well and, and pretty seamless that they were able to transition that within six months. They had everything ironed out, and it was out, and it was out functioning as it should. Um, so this is this is a page. If you just go uh, ndsos.gov, um, you'll find the Secretary of State's page. This is one we often send uh, to our clients to help with those logistical pieces. They also have that link at the bottom there, how to start a business in North Dakota, and that actually has quite a few good business development resources on it as well. Um, so uh, it, it includes all things about licensing and sales taxes and what you need to do if you're hiring employees, but it also includes some some more strategic pieces as well. All right, so um, after logistics, we, we get into uh, that, those business planning pieces, those, those four components we talked about, going from a value proposition to a marketing strategy uh, to an operations plan to a financial model. We, we have a couple different tools we use at the SBDC and then walk our clients through. This first one is just a one-page business model canvas, and, and um, this is one that's picked up popularity in the last 10 years or so, uh, banks are actually getting on board with having more of an executive summary, one to two to three page, or rather than a full 20 page business plan uh, required for, uh, for a loan application. 
So this is one we use quite a bit. It's called a one-page business model canvas. And even with, with projects we're working on, I just use it as a brain dumping exercise to get ideas out of my head and onto a piece of paper. Um, so the, each one of those different boxes you're seeing on that page is, is a different component of a business model. And, and a lot of times it helps our clients kind of expose blind spots or think into areas they haven't thought into before. Um, so it's going to include each one of those components and it'll have those prompts on there too. Um, you know, you can get one of these from us, but if you just Google uh, Business Model Canvas, there's a number of templates available online for free as well. So that this is a, kind of the paper tool we use. We also have a full SPDC template that, that we send out as a resource as well. Uh, but we've been increasingly using this online platform called LivePlan. And LivePlan is an online uh, business planning software that walks you through the business planning process. And uh, through the SBDC, we have a number of licenses that we purchase that we borrow out to our clients. Um, so if you're an SBDC client, you can have access to one of these for six months at no cost. Um, if you want to pay for it yourself, I think they're $13 a month. So not a real high cost on the subscription, um, but if you just wanted to test it out, uh, register for services with us, I'll tell you how to do that later, and then we can get you a live time license so you can go in there and, and play with it. Um, one of the, the best parts that I like about this is they have a, a investor pitch piece that you can use to kind of format and, and develop your, your pitch, um, but it also works really well with banks if you're going after loans. Um, the other piece that I really like in here functionality is the financial modeling scenario analysis. So it takes you step by step on uh, how to build that financial model, what numbers you need to plug in, and once you have your first model built, the scenario analysis piece that you can do from there by, hey, here's the different levers, levers you can pull within this model, you can save up to, uh, I think it's limitless, the number of scenarios you can, you can save. Um, for that uh, in that financial modeling piece. So you can have a very conservative, you can have a moderate, you can have a very aggressive, and, and anything in between there. So that's, uh, that's one thing that our clients really appreciate about this live plan program. All right, so I mentioned financial modeling and live plan. I also said that that's something that we get very hands-on with and probably what we're best known for. I'd say 50% of any given day we're spending in our financial modeling spreadsheet, which is what you're seeing here, part of it. Um, just plugging numbers, running numbers, crunching numbers for our clients. Um, so there's when we do financial modeling, there's four pieces that we're looking at typically in broad strokes. The first is, is the balance sheet or startup budget. Um, so whether you're an existing business and we, we're going to update this with your current balance sheet, what assets, what liabilities you have, uh, what potential new investments you need to be making, or you're a startup and you're looking at, all right, we need to purchase this building, or we're going to lease this space and we need this amount for leasehold improvements, we need to purchase this inventory. Um, this is the first thing we're going to work through with you is, is putting um, numbers to that startup budget or, or where you're at with your balance sheet right now and, uh, and start plugging this in. This is called a use of fund statement right here. Uh, it is just what it sounds like. It's how we're using funds that we're bringing into the business. And then the top half of this is the source of funds and that'd be where those dollars are coming from. So I'd say 90% of our clients are going after loans of some kind. Um, typically, uh, in a conventional lending uh, situation, a bank's looking for 20 to 25% cash into that project. So here you see this This project is uh, $3.4 million as it sits right now. So 20% uh, of that is going to be about $680,000 is what a bank would typically be looking for. Um, know that in North Dakota, we're, we're very fortunate. We have a lot of supplementary and, and um, kind of subsidized lending programs that can help us bring that number down, whether it's uh, some of the federal programs like the SBA 504, 7A program, or uh, through the um, maybe North Dakota, the North Dakota Opportunity Fund, uh, the Flex Pays program is there to build, bring down interest rates. A lot of times we can get that, that cash equity requirement down to 15 or 10% using some of those other programs coming on board and taking some of the risk of that project. Um, but this would be one of the first things we're working through. A big piece, you'll see all these different categories on here, and looking at the, you know, the value of an appraisal on a building, or how much inventory we're gonna need, or what we're gonna need for signage, those are, those are typically pretty um, simple to figure out. We can, we can put a market value on them or just ask a vendor how much that's gonna cost. The one that's harder to fill out and takes a lot more work is that working capital number. And when we say working capital, that's the amount of cash we want either in the bank or have as a line of credit that we have access to day one, knowing that whether it's a turnaround project or a new business, typically there's three to six to 12 months or more where we're losing cash every month. Okay? And so we need some cash on hand to help float that and help support that growth to where we get to the point where our revenue is, is supporting the business and all the expenses that go with it. 
Um, so the rest of this financial modeling exercise helps us determine what that working capital number needs to be. So sources, I said there's four pieces. The sources and use in the startup budget is the first one. Um, the second one we're going to look at is projecting revenue, okay? Um, so sales projection. And when we're looking at revenue, typically we're trying to separate out that, that out by cost structure. Um, when we say cost structure, it's, it's cost of goods sold into it. So um, let's say you're a restaurant and you're, you're pretty simple like JL beers, burgers and beers is pretty much all you do, right? Um, on that, something like that, typically your food is going to be 30 to 40 percent, meaning that if you're selling a burger for 10 bucks, your cost of goods into it for the beef, the burger, the lettuce is going to be three to four dollars, 30 to 40 percent. Where your beer is going to have a higher markup on that, typically, where that's going to be more like 25 percent. So we want to separate out those revenue streams if they have different cost structures. So depending on your business, that's a key thing you want to know is what different revenue streams do we have and what are our cost of goods related to those. Okay? Um, the, the reason that's important is uh, cost of goods and labor are the two biggest variable expenses. So when we say variable expenses, they go up when sales go up, they go down when sales go down. They vary with, with your sales. And those are, the sale, those are the two big expenses that need to be managed day to day. So anybody running a business, the, the three things they need to focus on every day in the business, sales first and foremost, cost of goods second, and labor third. If, if, if you have staff and if, if you have direct cost into your materials, that's day to day. Those are the three things that are determined whether your business is, is uh, excuse me, successful or not. Um, so we want you to understand what your cost structure is related to your different revenue streams. And, and if that's something you don't have a good grasp on, very common, um, that would be a priority for me is understanding what are my different revenue streams and, and the related cost of goods that go with each one of those. Okay. Um, so revenues, revenues number two, I got in number three, which is cost of goods, one of the variable expenses, the other one is labor, and we want to understand uh, what, what is a reasonable labor budget for this business. Um, some of it might, might not be anything, it's just what you're paying yourself, but we still want to account for that to make sure, um, hey, this is what I want to make, this is how much I need to make to justify the time I have in this business, I need to have that as a line item in my budget, okay? Um, another thing that especially sole proprietors don't do enough. Uh, is making sure you're prioritized and what do I need to make to, to make this business work and to justify my time into it. Um, so those are the two big variable expenses. So we have startup budget, um, revenue, variable expenses, and last is fixed expenses. And so those are the things that month to month, they're, they're not varying very much. Those like rent and what you're paying for insurance, if you're paying an accountant, um, typically a marketing budget that can vary, but hopefully you have a pretty set marketing budget that, that you know how much you're spending month to month. Um, so we're going to populate all of those as well to generate this cash flow projection, okay? And the big takeaway, the big takeaway, no point, that's okay. Um, so the big takeaway from this is, and I'm sorry these numbers are small, but it is this change in cash. So all that work that we went through very quickly there, this line right here where you're seeing numbers with parentheses around it, is really what we're looking for. That, that's the big takeaway we're looking for all of that financial modeling and numbers crunching is what is our change in cash look month to month. Okay? So you can see with this one, they start with this is a beginning balance in operating capital. They start with four hundred thousand, but over the first six months, they're they're losing almost one hundred eighty thousand dollars before they get a positive cash flow. Okay, so that that's the thing we're going to want to know that that's this is a what uh, negative cash flow can we project? So we know how, how much working capital we need on hand day one and what's a reasonable amount there. Um, typically, a bank isn't going to want to see uh, less than 60 days of cash on hand. So if you look at your budget and your monthly output or monthly cash outflow is $10,000, let's say, for cost of goods and labor and all your rent and things, a bank isn't going to want to see, and, and this is a bench, good benchmark for you too, that a sign of financial health is that you're never dipping below 60 days worth of that. Or if it's $10,000 for the month, $20,000 is what you want as a cash reserve at all times. 90 to 100 days, 120 days is much better, but that, that's what we're hearing from banks right now, especially with startups, is they never want to see that, that cash on hand drop below 60 days, okay? Um, so when we're working through this, and what we support our clients with, is just understanding what do we need in the bank day one to, tr to try to keep that, that number above 60 days. Um, depending on the industry, it can vary a bit, but that, that's a general benchmark, is, is that 60 days number, okay? Okay, I know that's a lot of numbers, and some of this is hard to read. Any questions on, on any of that at all? Okay. 
All right, so um, I mentioned we, we, get, we do a deeper dive into a few areas at the, at the SPDC. One is that financial model, and it's definitely what we're best known for. The other is, is business research and, and market validation. Um, so this is in the last five years, we've started to invest in tools like Vertical IQ, BizMiner, and Industrious CFO. And what these tools are doing is they're basically aggregating business intelligence and they aggregate data to give us benchmarks and, and market data so we can validate the assumptions we're putting into financial models. Um, so for instance, we can go into BizMiner and I was working with a, a veterinarian last week or a startup that's trying to, trying to start a new vet clinic. And so we can go into BizMiner and say, all right, I want to see what vet clinics in North Dakota with revenue under $2 million a year are doing in terms of financials. And some of the big takeaways we're looking for out of there is, all right, what is their cost of goods? So that we can say, all right, if you're, if you're paying this much for the medicines and for the supplies that you're doing, here's what your markup should be generally on services. Um, looking at what is your labor expense, all right? So generally, if you're doing $2 million a year in, in sales as a vet clinic, that they'll, they'll have you typically 10 to 15 firms that they pull financial data from and aggregate it for you. So you can say, all right, here's what your labor budget should be. Here's what a typical occupancy expense should be. So what are we paying for rent or, or mortgage or, or utilities and all those things. Um, that's really important intelligence for our clients to have, especially if they're going after investment. I mean, one, so they can make informed decisions, but if you're without some of that validation, if you're going to a bank and just pulling numbers out of thin air or bringing assumptions in, it, it's a much harder case to, to validate some of those things. And it's one of the reasons why we're seeing banks more accepting of a two to three page executive summary rather than a full business plan because we have some of these tools and some of that data out there that we can help validate without having to do 20 pages of a business plan there. Um, so Vertical IQ, BizMiner, Industry CFO, uh, the, the uh, industry of CFO is, is definitely more relevant for existing businesses. Uh, with that one, it takes a little more work on our part, but what it allows us to do is, if you have good books and you can give us uh, your P&L cash flow and balance sheet, we can populate a client file in industry of CFO, and it'll give you comps to all of your peer group. Um, where you're at in liquidity and in, in your variable expenses and in your sales growth, um, and it'll, it'll provide some really interesting intelligence. That's this one on the left here is actually an industrious CFO report uh, where we populated a, a client file with all of their existing financials and it's pulling out for us different insights. All right, here's, here's where you're doing really well. Here's compared to your peer group, how you could be doing better. Um, just gives you some, some nice uh, uh, market data and industry data to, to make decisions with. Um, Lastly, I said we uh, financial modeling, we were definitely probably always what we've been best known for. Business research has been something in the last five years that we've done a lot more of. And then this is more recently uh, with the trend of a lot of baby boomers exiting and trying to sell businesses, we, we've really gotten into a, a lot of exit and succession planning. Um, and a big piece with that is uh, doing pricing analysis on businesses, doing appraisals on businesses. And while we're not certified appraisals, we are all trained as accredited business intermediaries. Um, so we can kind of, we, well, not kind of, we can actually be like a Kelly Blue Book for businesses, where if you, you know, if you take a car, put on Kelly Blue Book, put all the specs in there, it'll give you a range of value for that high end, medium, low end. And that, that's what we're doing too, is that, uh, we can, we can look at a, a business's financials, look at their balance sheet, and provide a, a pricing analysis. Um, it takes some time, so our turnaround time on this is getting better because we're, we're kind of new at it. Uh, but we're, we're providing a range of value within which you can negotiate and say, all right, here's, here's a reasonable amount that, that we'd want to pay for this business. Um, critical piece with this is, of course, on the balance sheet, getting an appraisal on a building isn't that difficult. Uh, appraising inventory can be tricky, but, but you can typically get a pretty good market value on those. The, the trickiest part and the one that's almost always the sticking point on the sale of a business is the blue sky or what is the value of the book of business. So what is the value of the cash flow generated by the business? And that's, that's what that, uh, that ABI training that we had uh, two years ago helps us do is, is look at the financials, look at the, the cash flow generated, projecting forward what's a reasonable range on the value of that book of business to, uh, to help get past some of those sticking points and, and uh, help, help with some of those transactions. So. All right, so that's a quick uh, overview um, in broad strokes of what we do at the SBDC and how we support clients. Uh, a couple more things I wanted to get into. First, and in how to access our services. 
Um, so I mentioned we don't charge for anything, but we do collect data from our clients, and one of the first things we need our clients to do is register for services. So that's at ndsbdc.org. Uh, you go on there, register, and that, that gets you an RQ to get on our schedule. Um, that'll, that'll get you uh, assigned to the appropriate center, depending on where you're at. Uh, it sounds like a lot of the folks in this room I'd, I'd be working with. I go all the way up to Underwood and then Mercer and Russo up there. Um, so yeah, that, that'd be the first thing if you're interested in accessing any of our services. Uh, ndsbdc.org is, is where you want to go. And then I want to talk, uh, one of the things that uh, a challenge for us is just limited bandwidth. There are 15 of us across the state, including the staff in our lead center that's uh, helping with admin and marketing and things like that. And, and any one of us centers is, is dealing with 60 to 100 clients at any given, at given time. So that, that's a big challenge for us. We're always trying to think into ways that how do we provide more resources, provide more uh, tools without our time directly tied to them. So I want to take you through a few of the, the most valuable tools that, that our clients are using from us. Uh, the first, and uh, definitely the one that's kind of like our Bible, is this uh, business resource guide. We recently updated this just last year. Uh, this is available on that website, ndsbdc.org, or paper copies in all of our offices. Uh, but this takes you through all kind of all the steps we just talked about with, with more detail and written narrative. There's there's paper tools in here on developing startup budgets and uh, projecting revenues, expenses. Um, there's uh, that that's a table of contents right there. You can see it, it gets into a, a lot of different topics, and we tried to hit on um, all of the most frequently asked questions that we get from our clients. So. Uh, the, there's a PDF online available at ndsbdc.org, um, so that, that would be one of the first places I'd point you to. Uh, next, um, here's another um, uh, resource that, that is put together in partnership with our SBDCs in Minnesota and South Dakota, as well as uh, VBOC, which is the veteran-owned business organization. Uh, North Dakota Women's Business Center, you guys met Christy earlier today. Uh, we all partner to put together these business builders webinars. And again, we're, we're trying to find subject matter ex experts that are addressing some of the most common questions that we get from our clients. Um, so we, do, we typically do them monthly. In April, uh, we have one about understanding financial documents. Uh, May of 2024, it's actually April 28th through May 4th, is Small Business Week. So we'll be doing a series of webinars that week that's, that's to be announced. We typically, we, we announce those uh, two weeks out. And then in June, we have legal complications of artificial intelligence. We're, we're getting more and more questions uh, on AI. But um, these are free, and, and they are subject matter experts that are typically paid in other avenues to, to, to provide this kind of content. Um, so I would, uh, I would highly recommend that you uh, bookmark that ndsbdc.org forward slash on demand web link. Uh, just keep tabs on, on what, what's coming up in the Business Builders webinar calendar and in that series. Um, I promise you a couple times a year there'll, there'll be a topic that, uh, that's relevant to you. All right, next uh, platform I want to talk about here is MainVest. So this is a recent development as well. Um, one, of the th one of the issues or trends we're seeing in North Dakota is that uh, per capita, North Dakota is one of the wealthiest states in the country in terms of small population per capita. We, we have a lot of money in the state. Uh, what we don't see is a lot of venture capital or private investment in small business unless that's kind of a part of a select group of people in each community that are doing it. Um, so MainVest is a way that we wanted to address this. Uh, it's starting to get some legs. We just launched it last year. And what this is, is MainVest is a national platform, um, but they developed for us a North Dakota specific hub where if you're a business looking for investment, uh, you apply, you get vetted by them, they, they uh, review your financials, they review the, the project parameters, like similar to how a bank would do it, and then they will put a crowdfunding uh, page on MainVest North Dakota for your business. And so folks looking to invest in businesses in North Dakota can go on MainVest and see what businesses are on there, what businesses are looking for funding, they can review their business plan, they can review their risk profile, and they can invest with a return on that investment. Okay. So for, I think both investors, but mainly for the business owners, is the payment back are revenue based, um, meaning it's based on a percentage of your revenue is what you're getting back. Okay. Um, so the, the, way, the reason that's really nice for, for startups and for anybody that's investing and in, in trying to grow their business is typically you go after a loan and there's a set interest rate with a set payment term and a set monthly payment, right? So regardless of where your revenue is at, you're going to owe that four grand or six grand or ten grand a month to pay your debt service. 
Okay, with with Mainvest, the way the payments work, it, it's a percentage of your revenue. So if your sales are down, that's typically a time when you can't. That it's harder to make that debt payment, and you're sometimes having to go to your bank and say, "Hey, can I get interest only for a while?" Um, sometimes banks are willing to work with you. A lot of times they're not. In this in this program, when your sales are down, your payment goes down with those sales. Um, so it's kind of a partnership between investments and, or, excuse me, investors and business owners uh, to support that business. Yes. How is this different than like the GBA that, that you're seeing a lot of now? Uh, GBA, I'm not familiar with that. It's an investment um, program that is also um, talks about North Dakota and then it's also nationwide. Sure. Is that the generator on the east side of the state? Is that? Yeah, there's one in Fargo, Grand sure. Forks. Yep. So yeah. yeah. So they. Um, I, and my understanding is they're more traditional VC uh, venture capital yeah. um, um, structure. Um, so you need to put together like uh, it, it's a great program, uh, but uh, to get into that, you have to put together all the securities disclosures, and you have.